Welcome back to Bray Birch DFS, one of the best places for PGA, NFL, MLB, and NBA news, and of course, DFS. If you don't know by now, I'm Walt. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to my channel. All right, so let's jump into this round three analysis of the John Deere Classic. This has been a very entertaining uh, tournament so far. I kind of like these birdie fests because anybody can win versus some of the more challenging uh, contests where it's kind of obvious that it's only about five or ten players that can actually win the tournament. All right, so let's pull up my checklist, and today we're going to look at eight things. So we got to talk about the morning weather edge, and the morning weather edge is real. The conditions are less firm in the morning, and it's just better in general at most courses. And to this course, uh, DPC TPC Deer Run, excuse me, is no exception. So I don't think you can go crazy and put six people from the morning because these are professional golfers. So, I mean, there's going to be a, a player or two from the afternoon uh, that's going to fight through the lesser conditions and probably make it into the optimal lineup. But definitely, I see nothing wrong with the 4-2, or if you really can make it make sense, a 5-1 morning to afternoon uh, kind of lineup construction. All right, so the second thing is it's only one round, and we have to remember this, and especially at a birdie fest and with a field like this, any one of these players can go off. We saw Springer come out of nowhere and uh, shoot a record round on round one. So anybody can do well. You got to remember that. You don't want to overthink this. Now, that doesn't mean, and that's kind of my number four, that doesn't mean just be random about it, but you have to understand that these are professional golfers on a relatively easy course. So you shouldn't freak out too much about putting players that under normal situations in a different kind of tournament you would never play. Definitely for four days and probably not even in showdown. Number three, there's game theory. This is not straight up betting. You're going up against other people. So, I mean, you can't just get too chalky. I mean, you can you can do that, but it just generally doesn't work out well just being really chalky. So there's a little bit of game theory involved in this. It's not involved if you were, you know, on DraftKings Sportsbook or, you know, MGM or FanDuel, something like that, where it's just straight up betting and you don't care whether 100 people win or, you um, one person wins but you know when it comes to dfs you want to be the only one with that lineup or at the very least you don't want to share it with that many people and then the luck and gut and it's really luck and gut really applies to a week like this where the difference between you know the difference between player a and b is not a big difference there's not a big difference between a lot of these people in the uh you know from a from a skill perspective <laughs> between being, you know these some of these golfers in the 6000 so i mean don't over don't overthink it get some luck and gut in there if you're feeling you know like you know what this is a good time just going into the 6000 i'm going to say somebody random this is a good time to play harry hall i mean apparently it was he's in third place you see what i mean it's a good time to play i mean it was random and i picked harry hall so it's a good time to play harry hall this is the kind of tournament and showdown is the situation where you can do that all right, so let's pull up my top level stats. And I, I, look, I created these stats because every tournament, you know, is different. So we can kind of look at these top level stats and we can see that for round one, the range of scores went from nine over par to 12 under par. We obviously, you know, Springer set a record. Um, so there was a 21 stroke spread. And for round two, there wasn't a huge difference. It was an 18 stroke spread. You have, you know, player a player with that uh, shot a 10 over par, but you can see the ceiling was much lower because the conditions were tougher today, mostly because because you had those gusty winds that were out there. So you can see in the second box, a huge difference for round one, you had 24 players that shot a six under par or better, and that dropped down to 15 for round two. So obviously the windier conditions and slightly firmer, you know, course made it a little bit more difficult but I just say a little bit more because the mode, which is the score that shows up the most often was exactly the same from round one to round two. So three under par was a really popular score, just showing you that this is still a relatively easy course. However, the median, because of the windier conditions, the median did go down to two under par. So this is very important because when you're tracking your scores, you know, under normal conditions, non birdie fest conditions, you, you think you're doing well, with the three under par, you're like, yeah, I'm doing well. My round is starting off well, but 
that's like the median that's like the most so if you're not putting up if you're not if you don't have a lot of players that have four under par five under par something like that just know that you're either falling behind or just doing average so you might end up min cashing all right so uh this next the person i have in this bottom box is the i'm calling it my almost doesn't count these are players that basically had a small stretch of of holes that kind of just really ruined them so we can talk about novak in round one in round one novak between holes 9 10 and 11 he shot a five over par so just really really messed up his round outside of those holes he actually shot nine under par so it just kind of goes to show when you're looking at the final you know the final score for the round there's some things that are happening there both good and bad that you're not just seeing if you're not digging or using tools or other things like that so yeah 9 10th 11 hole for a novak round one just didn't work out for him so almost doesn't count and then we have springer we know round one he was a straight up beast set a record but in round two he had a really tough stretch a uh, holes three four and six he shot four over par the rest of the round he shot four under par and he ended up at that record breaking round you know just having an even round which gets to something when it comes to birdie fest and when it comes to these contests where you have players uh that are lower that or lower ranked as far as you know fedex cup and all these things you have to ask yourself did i just watch that player have their peak round at the flip side did i just watch this this player have their worst round because a lot of these players because they're professional golfers they can do well for one round maybe even two rounds but once again they can't do it for four rounds so i think most of us uh, kind of had a good idea that Hayden Springer wasn't going to come close to what he did, especially when you look at some of the, the strokes gain uh, data. He wasn't going to, there was a very low probability because anything's possible in statistics and sports. There was a very low probability that he was going to go back and have the same round that he had based on um, what we've seen from Hayden Springer in his career. But that being said, he did have that tough, uh, tough stretch and ended up following up the record breaking round with just going even. All right, so let's look at those strokes gain data. And off the tee, you have Max Gracerman uh, leading off the tee, followed by Sung J.M. You have Jake Knapp barely making the cut. You have Luke Klen, the amateur. I've uh, been talking about, talked about him a lot in my tournament overview. And you have Davis Thomas, who came in uh, with some of the best recent form. Uh, approach, you have Joshua Creel. Yes, Joshua Creel, that Creel, the person I'm sure that if he tapped you on your shoulder, you would not know who he is. He has been killing it on approach. You have Kevin Yu at number two, Bryce Garnett. You have the Canadian Adam Spenson at number four, and you have Keith Mitchell, who a lot of people were excited about at number five. Then around the greens, you have CT Pan, uh, number one. You have Eric Cole, number two, just you know having a bounce back kind of tournament. Denny McCarthy, everybody's a favorite. Bo Hosler and Ben Silverman at number five. And then putting, we have the person that came in with the best recent form, Aaron Rye, just killing it on putting. You have Andrew Novak, number two, Lucas Glover, the old man. I say that I'm 43. <laughs> the old man, Lucas Glover, putting really well, just really a, a turnaround if you really know his strengths. For him to be in the top five in putting is, uh, is very impressive. You have uh, Dylan Fratelli, who won this in 2019, doing really well. He was basically the Stone Cold minimum at number four. And you have Ryan Palmer at number five. All right, so let's go over the DraftKings and I'm going to give you, you know, my recommendation in all of the salary tiers. So 10,000 and above, we're not going to rock the boat. I just told you uh, what Aaron Wright was doing as far as putting and he has the best recent form and he's playing really well now. So I don't think it's the time to get cute. I mentioned Clannon and all these players I mentioned um, in my tournament overview and Clint's no exception, the amateur uh, from the University of Florida, um, 9,100 doing really well off the tee in the eight thousands, you know, Kevin, you, I just mentioned him also mentioned him in the uh, tournament overview at 8,200. And then you have one of the best names in sports, Jonathan Vegas, love the name, especially from a DFS perspective. He is a round three stud. We'll talk about him in a minute. And then you have Dylan Fratelli, who I just mentioned won this in 2019. 
All right, so let's look at those round three studs. So you have Ben Griffin, you have Hayden Buckley, you have Davis Thompson, you have Jonathan Vegas, and you have Ben Silverman. So let me know your thoughts. Feel free to leave any comments, but otherwise go out there and win that guap.